All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, well, actually, that's right. I'm so used to recording in the afternoon. It's the morning. It's Friday morning. We changed up, and I even messed myself up. Oh, my. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Dad and I are uh, in the classroom today. We are recording the School of Ministry lesson number 12. This Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, and so we're diverting from the series of lessons we've been talking from the letters of Peter and Jude and uh, we will be talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit uh, we're coming out of several passages of scripture uh, the first one you may think uh, is maybe a little different because we're coming out of Numbers chapter 11 where uh, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit is prefigured uh, we'll also then next Sunday we will resume our lesson uh, with lesson number uh, uh, 13, talking about a discerning and a uh, persevering people, and that will be coming out of the book or letter of Jude. And so that will be the last letter uh, lesson for this quarter. So I uh, want you to um, get the new quarterly. I have those in my office. If you haven't picked one up on Sundays or Wednesdays, uh, please see me this Sunday so you can have that and be ready. Uh, in the next two weeks or you can also call or text uh, and let me know you need a book if you can't get here you're not comfortable coming out yet I'll mail you one so uh, I want you to have the the new uh, school of ministry uh, lesson booklet so uh, communicate with me and let me know what you need and I'll get it to you uh, we want to uh, make some announcements and then we're going to pray and get right into the word today. Um, we, ladies, I want to remind you that uh, this Tuesday, uh, the 18th at 8 p.m., will be your next Awaken to Wonder discipleship class with Natalie uh, via the Zoom Zoom platform. Uh, ladies, if you haven't joined us yet, you can still do that. Uh, you can just go to the Wow Center website and uh, register for that. As also. Uh, you would need to go to the bookstore and purchase the book that they're using for that. Also, uh, the next clothing closet giveaway will be on Saturday, June the 5th over at Campus 2 with Pastor Terry. The time has changed a little bit. It used to be from 11 to 3. It's now 11 to 2. So note that time change. Also, remember that we have uh, the uh, nursery and Wild Kids uh, preschool class is now open for the 11 a.m. service only. Uh, no school of ministry just yet, but we're working on that. Also, if you're looking for a job, DCA is looking to hire part-time and full-time teachers as well as teacher assistants. And so if you love children and you love the Lord and you want to uh, show children how to love the Lord, then uh, that's a great place for you to work. Uh, also, uh, there will be an Ancient Past Seminar sponsored by uh, Zion's Sake next week. It will be May 23rd. Uh, 22nd and 23rd. Uh, you can contact Zion Six office for registration information. DCA also has uh, car, uh, cruise through car wash gift cards available. Those make great gifts. And then also remember that uh, on Saturday, May the 22nd from 4 to 6.30 p.m. will be the Holy Spirit Q&A day with Pastor Russell and Sylvia in the sanctuary. Also, uh, we are preparing, we're wrapping up the 2020-21 school year with GSSM and preparing for the 21-22 school year with the Global School of Supernatural Ministry. So if you're interested in being a part of GSSM Hampton Roads for the next school year, then please sign up in the lobby. There is an interest meeting that's going to be held on Sunday, June the 13th at 5 p.m. in the sanctuary with Natalie as well as also with Dr. Mike Hutchings from uh, Global. Also, uh, we are desiring to restart our bus ministry here at WOW. Uh, we have several seniors that uh, need and transportation to church and we're, are, are wanting to come back to church. However, we need drivers. Uh, we During COVID in the last year and a half, we've had some drivers who've transitioned out of the air due to employment changes and things like that. and so. I need drivers, so if you're interested uh, in, in driving for one Sunday a month, uh, no CDL is required. If you'll just call, contact me, uh, schedule an interview with me, it'll take about 20 minutes, and uh, we can talk about bus ministry. 
All right, thank you. Also, remember that there will be uh, on that same July, the I mean June the 13th at 5 p.m. in room 110 will be our water baptism class. This is the first class we've had in over a year. And then that's the class on Sunday evening by uh, uh, Bill Adams. Also, if you have children that want to be baptized, Pastor Greg will do a class on that Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And uh, then the the baptism will take place the following Saturday morning at Yorktown Beach. So we'll have the class on the 13th at 10 for children, 5 p.m. for the adults. And then the next Saturday morning at 10, we will uh, have the baptism at Yorktown Beach. Also, uh, graduation recognition Sunday is going to be June the 6th, Sunday, June the 6th. And so we'll be recognizing our high school and our college graduates. And uh, we need to uh, you to sign up. We, we know of quite a few of you who are graduating, but maybe we don't know all of you. And so we're really asking if you would sign up in the lobby uh, and please mark whether it's high school or college. All right. OK, we want to pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the word this morning. Uh, we have um, several uh, that have uh, lost loved ones in the rat last week or two. We've had a couple funerals. Uh, there, the uh, Williams family, the Reed family, uh, and we were notified last evening uh, uh, Sister Croom passed away, and so we want to remember Billy and his family. Uh, we don't have arrangements made yet, but when we do, we'll let you know. But please lift up Billy and his family and the loss of his wife yesterday afternoon. Also, we have several that uh, are in the hospital um, and recovering, uh, Evelyn Nelson and uh, Others, I believe Helen Heaster went to the ER yesterday. I don't know if she's home or not, but we want to pray for Helen. And then uh, Baretha Dawkins and others that uh, just have a real need of uh, physical touch in their lives. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your blessings today. We give you glory and honor, and we thank you, Father Lord, for who you are. And Lord, for your direction, your peace, your comfort, your joy. Father Lord, your your uh, stamina that you give us, Lord, to persevere in difficult times. Yes. We thank you, Father, Lord, for answers to prayer. We yes. thank you for your yes. provision. We thank you, Father, Lord, for the opportunity to live in this nation and this country Hallelujah. and the freedoms we have. And, yes. Father, we pray that we would guard those freedoms, Hallelujah. that we would stand up for those freedoms. Yes. And, Father, Lord, that the church would not be a silent voice, but that we would speak and be heard. We praise you, Father, and we ask God today that you would touch these on our prayer list. Lord, all those in the hospitals, those that are uh, coming home, uh, Helen Heaster, Baretha Dawkins, others, Lord, who uh, have been in, in uh, uh, hospital care this week. Father, we pray, Father, that you would give your peace and comfort. Heal these bodies. Yes. Father, Lord, uh, relieve from pain and stress and worry and concern. Father, Lord, and minister, Lord, to uh, Billy. Uh, Kroom and his family and the loss of Bonnie yesterday. Yes. We pray your comfort and peace of the Holy Spirit. Bless yes. them. Father, be with the Williams family and the passing of Ty last week and, and the Reed family, Father Lord, and the passing of Mark. We just pray your comfort, your grace, your mercy, Hallelujah. your kindness. Lord, speak to them. Be with them, Father Lord, in the days to come. We ask now, Father Lord, as we uh, come and, and deliver your word in this lesson from... Yes. Uh, uh, the book of uh, Numbers and Acts, Ephesians, Colossians, I mean uh, Galatians and uh, Corinthians. We pray, Father Lord, that your word would speak to us. Bless us now, Lord, as we, yes. we go into the word and we talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We ask God that you would uh, touch us today, use us for your glory, and we give you the praise and glory and honor. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen and amen. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Numbers chapter 11. And we're going to look at verse 24 down through 29. In the lesson today, we are actually uh, looking at Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost Sunday is the seventh Sunday after Easter or Resurrection Day. So this lesson then is about the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the Bible tells us and declares that the gift of the Holy Spirit to the early church as promised by Christ and even promised by the prophets uh, came on the Jewish feast day called Pentecost. Right. Um, because of the spiritual and the historical significance of this event for the church, Pentecost along with uh, Christmas 
and well and resurrection day these are the three major holidays yes. uh along uh with uh, for the christian on the christian calendar for christian family and so uh, when we look at these we we, we kind of see these as the three holy days that we celebrate yes. one the birth of christ two uh he is and well, well let me back up the birth of christ who is the incarnate son of god Secondly, we, re we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we talk and celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit, which was poured out upon the early church and continues to be poured out upon his church. So it's not just a one-time historical event. The Holy Spirit is being poured out now every day since that time upon the church. So the lesson outlined for the lesson today is that we're going to be, talk about being filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at Numbers 11 where the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is prefigured to us. And then also talking about spirit-filled living and then spirit-filled unity and service. So we, we not only uh, be filled with the Holy Spirit, but then we live as being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then we actually come together with the other body of Christ and we serve together filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and so uh, the lesson uh, historically today uh, contains a passage of scripture, as I mentioned, from the book of Numbers. And we know that Numbers was written by Moses, and it was written somewhere around 1445 B.C. That's 1,445 years before the birth of Christ. All right. Now, the other texts are all from the New Testament, and the day of Pentecost events are described in Acts chapter 2 uh, are believed to have occurred. So the events that are in Acts 2 are believed to have occurred around A.D. 30, which was about seven weeks after uh, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we're going to see this. We're going to discuss these points. But we're also going to see that in this, Jesus commanded uh, his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, what I want to point out to you is that Luke is the only New Testament author that talks about this. Luke discusses it. Luke is in, uh, in his book, in the Gospel of Luke, and also in the book of Acts. He's the only New Testament writer who tells us that Jesus commanded his disciples to stay in Jerusalem, to wait there in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Then he tells about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. So he's, got, he's the one that tells us about Jesus saying, stay and wait. And then he's also the one that tells us about the actual coming of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. So I thought that maybe you would find that a little bit interesting. All right, now let's read from Numbers chapter 11, verse 24 down through 29. This is where Moses is choosing 70 leaders. So Moses went out and reported the Lord's words to the people. He gathered the 70 elders and stationed them around the tabernacle. The tabernacle is the portable tent, the uh, place of the habitation of God. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. Then he gave the 70 elders the same spirit that was upon Moses. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but this never happened again. Okay, verse 26. Two men, Eldad and Medad, had stayed behind in the camp. They were listed among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle. Yet the Spirit rested upon them as well. So they prophesied there in the camp. A young man ran and reported to Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' assistant since his youth, protested, Moses, my master, make them stop. But Moses replied, Are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his Spirit upon them all. Then Moses returned to the camp with the elders of Israel. In this passage, we are seeing the gift of the Holy Spirit being prefigured. What we mean by that, at the command of Moses, uh, he chose, or excuse me, at the, God's command, God uh, told Moses to, to select 70 elders 
uh, of Israel to assist him in the governance of the people. If you look at chapter 11, go back to verse 16, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather before me seventy men who are recognized as elders and leaders of Israel. Bring them to the tabernacle to stand there with you. Okay? So we know that God had commanded him to select these uh, uh, elders to assist him in the governance of the people of Israel. It was just too much for one man. And, and his father-in-law had recommended this. The Lord now tells him to do so. And so we see then that they come together and he says, take them and go to the tabernacle. Now verse 17 also tells us that they're, they're there at the tabernacle. They're going to be enabled by the Holy Spirit. And so we see it says that, and the King James says, the Lord took of the Spirit that was upon Moses and gave it to the uh, 70 elders and they prophesied it did not cease all right, and that what that means did not cease means it really means that they didn't do so again after that in verse 25. Now, during the Old Testament era or period, prophesying was the normative. It was the normal, okay? It was the normative. It was, it was uh, um, immediately observable evidence that a person had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here in this passage, God tells Moses, take 70 elders, go to the tabernacle with you, right? He stations them around the tabernacle. God's spirit comes down, talks with Moses. He takes of the spirit of, that, was upon, that he had put upon Moses and shares it with the 70 elders. What is the evidence that the Lord had anointed this, them with his Holy Spirit? They began to prophesy. So that in the Old Testament era is the normative evidence that the Spirit of God had been placed upon them. Now notice, two of the chosen elders, Eldad and Medad, uh, they were in the camp. They were not at the tabernacle. They, they were at the camp. Notice, they also received the Spirit of the Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and they also prophesied there in the camp. It's kind of unique, Mr. Rush, what you're talking about here in the Old Testament about the Holy Spirit. It's the same Holy Spirit from the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. Exactly. It's just that the anointing back then in the Old Testament right. was prophesying. In the New Testament, yeah. it's a speaking in other tongues. Utterances. And it can be known or unknown tongues. Correct. Yeah, yeah. So a young man in the camp reported to Moses that Eldad and Medad uh, were prophesying in the camp. Now Joshua was a servant to Moses. He was Moses' assistant and had been so. And he, he uh, counseled Moses to forbid them or to stop them from prophesying in the camp. Now, what was Moses' response to that? He said, would God that all of the Lord's people were yes. prophets. All right, I wish that all of them were the prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon all of them. Okay, all right. So the gift of the Holy Spirit received by these 70 elders and Moses' prayer that the Lord would give his spirit to all of his people is prefiguring prophetically Correct. the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church yes. on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Yes. All right, so now let's go to Acts chapter 2. And let's look at verse 1 through 4 and then verse 16 and 17. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages, other known languages, as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. Now go down to verse 16, 17. No, what you have seen was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. Yes. In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Notice that Peter is pre preaching to the crowd after the anointing and the Holy Spirit comes. Peter's preaching to the crowd 
giving definition to what's occurring, yes. okay, because they don't understand right. how that people are hearing the message of God, the, the, the uh, gospel of God, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ being preached to all these people that are in the city of Jerusalem, uh, because they've all, Jews from all around the world, have come into the city of Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, okay, uh, the first harvest, okay, Shavuot. And so they're coming in, and, and they hear these uh, Galileans uh, 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 speaking in languages that they know they don't know themselves, but that they, they're being anointed to speak. Okay? And so we know if you look at the list, there's 16 different nationalities of people that are represented yes. here, yes. and we see that the Holy Spirit has anointed them. But notice it says, Peter interprets and says, and says, in the last days I will pour out my spirit okay all right upon all people so Peter interprets that as the last days the last days started on the day of Pentecost AD 30 so we're in the last days Amen. and maybe we're in the last of the last days <laughs> all right seeing seeing that now notice that in the Old Testament era predictive prophecies foretold about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the people of God. Acts chapter 2 tells of the beginning of the fulfillment of those prophecies yes. as we just read in verse 16, 17, and 18. So we know that we, we've just shared a passage in Numbers 11. I've just also identified another passage in Joel chapter 2 about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So now, let's go back for a moment, and let's think about this Day of Pentecost. This Day of Pentecost is a Jewish religious festival, and it follows the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. It not only follows his resurrection, but his ascension ten days later into heaven. And so we see ten days after that, or upon his ascension, ten days later, the Holy Spirit is poured out on all of Jesus' assembled uh, disciples. Now, Notice that speaking as the Holy Spirit gives them utterance. Okay, another word for utterance is prophesying. And so they spoke in language that they had not previously learned. Correct. Okay, all right, verse 4 tells us that. And they're testifying in verse 11 of the wonderful works of God. Let's go back and read that. All right, um, both Jew and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, and and we all hear these, one, these people speaking <clears throat> in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. Okay. Another unique point there is that these languages were unknown to the speakers, right. but known to the hearers. Right, known to the hearers. Now, remember, because this is a Jewish religious festival, yes. then you've got Jews that are from all around the world that have come into Jerusalem. Right. Okay. Now, is that by happenstance? No. God has a plan. Okay. He's going to pour out his spirit upon the Jesus' disciples, all right? and then they then become the speakers of the gospel message. Right? So what these wonderful works of God, he's not talking about necessarily creation, but he's talking about the wonderful work of redemption Hallelujah. through the Lord Jesus Christ. So yes. they are all, the 120 are all speaking in tongues to the thousands that have gathered in Jerusalem. Correct. The population of Jerusalem has swelled yeah. well yeah. beyond its capacity yes. okay, uh, because of this Jewish festival. How do we know that? Well, it says... Look back up here. Here we are, Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, the province of Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the areas of Libya, around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. Okay, And we're all hearing, so there's 16 different groups of people that are in Jerusalem for this festival. Okay. So, so they're here, okay, and they're speaking, uh, the, the apostles, I mean the disciples of Christ are speaking and, and under the utterance of the Holy Spirit. They don't know these other 16 languages. Right. They are Judeans and Galileans, and they know, if, if possibly, the, at most, they would know maybe three languages, Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew, right. okay, possibly those three. Right. But you've got people here from 16 other areas of the world that speak different languages. Yes. And we see that they're 
prophesying, they're speaking in languages they don't know, okay, testifying to the works of God. Now, shortly before Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples that they would be baptized in or with the Holy Ghost, and he says, not many days hence. So if you flip over one page in your Bible, look at chapter 1, verse 5. John baptized with water, but in a few days I will be, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay? All right? So, and, and let me talk about that. When, you, when it says be baptized, that really means immersed. That really means immersed there. In other words, uh, flooding uh, part of your life. In other words, the, the Holy Spirit's going to flood you into your life Overcoming. and immerse you, just like water baptism. Okay? All right? We believe in, 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 in uh, immersion, total immersion. Right. You know, you're dunked under the water. Okay? All right? So when we talk about this and we see this, what we're really seeing is that they're being filled with the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Spirit came. And their experience was being described as being filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 4. So we conclude then that a Christian's first experience of being filled with the Holy Spirit is the same as being baptized okay, in the Holy Spirit. Or you can say it another way, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit as it's talked about in Acts chapter 11 verse 15. So you can be filled with the Spirit, you can be baptized in the Spirit, you can be... Uh, receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's all describing the same event. Now, on the day of Pentecost, Peter and the other apostles in, in verse 14 are interpret the reception of the gift of the Holy Spirit as the beginning of the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy about God's abundant outpouring of His Spirit on His people. Okay, So go back to chapter 2, look at verse 16. We've read it, but let's read it. So now what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. So Peter and the apostles immediately recognized this as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecy. Right. Right? So they interpret that. So in the, in the Old Testament era, prophesying uh, and the interpretation of God-given visions and dreams was regarded, regarded as the evidences of a person having received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter and the apostles obviously regarded speaking with tongues by inspiration of the Holy Spirit as the same spiritual nature as prophesying yes. and receiving relative, uh, relevatory uh, dreams and visions yes. from God. Okay, And that's alluded to uh, in verse 17. They're tying it all together. Putting it all together. So speaking in, in uh, tongues is also an evidence, as, as is prophesying, yes. Yes. as are dreams uh, and visions that yes. come from God. Now, so from A.D. 30, the day of Pentecost, A.D. 30, when the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and upon the believers there, we then have started what is known as the Christian era. Okay? And that's the time in which God's Holy Spirit is being poured out on believers in the church. Notice, is being poured out, not has been. Okay? All right. All right. So, in other words, we see, and the, the, the Peter and the apostles see, that this is the fulfillment of Numbers chapter 11. Okay? Yes. Yes. As Numbers chapter 11. So, believers in Christ can and should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, in regeneration, when we talk about regeneration, when you're saved or in your new birth, re we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and we're baptized spiritually in, by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. All right? We know that from 1 Corinthians 12, 13. It says, Now, if any man hath not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Okay? So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit by regeneration identifies us. In other words, it's the Holy Spirit that woos and draws you to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of your sin and identifies, helps you to identify your need for Christ. And when you accept Christ, you accept His Spirit. Okay, Mr. Rush, another point too is that uh, we, we Pentecostals or, or Church of God tend to 
lean toward that this is a denominational experience when in fact mm -hmm. it is not. No. This is a biblical event here. This is the that, body of Christ experience. That is for all Christians. Yes, all believers. Regardless of denomination. Exactly. It has nothing to do with the denomination. Correct. It has everything to do with the promise of God to his people. Through his son, yeah. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. So, so we... At your, at your regeneration, at your new birth, you receive the Holy Spirit, but afterwards or subsequent to your new birth in Christ, then we can, by Christ, be baptized yes. in the Holy Spirit or yes. filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. This is talked about in John chapter 1. Look at John chapter 1, verse 33. Let's go back to verse 32 for the context. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know he was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. Okay? All right? I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. Amen. Okay? So, we know that Jesus Christ will enable us to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. All right. Also notice that that it's the Holy Spirit that spiritually empowers us for Christian living and ministry. All right. Correct. So go back to Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power. That's the empowerment. Yes, okay? yes. All right? And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We know that is the Great Commission. But we also see that it is the Holy Spirit is the power to tell. Mm -hmm. It's the power to speak. It's the power, the boldness, and the power and authority to tell the gospel message. The anointing. Okay? Yeah, it's in the anointing, All right? Now, now let's look at our second point, and let's stay in Acts chapter 2, and let's go down to verse 41. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Okay, verse 42. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over all of them, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All of the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Going down to verse 47. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Okay. Now, in this second portion of the lesson, we're talking about spirit-filled living. So receiving the spirit, part one. Now part two is walking in that spirit uh, and living it out. Now, also I want you to flip over to Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18. Now let's read down through 21. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And furthermore, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So these are instructions on how we are to live. So basically what we're talking about here in, in Acts 2, 41 through 47 and Ephesians 5, we're actually talking about the Christian community and spiritual worship. So we as a body of believers come together as a community. So if a group of people are filled with the Holy Spirit, what evidences would you might expect to see in their living? Right? Tongues. Tongues. Signs. Signs. Wonders. wonders miracles. Okay. So when the disciples 
of Jesus were filled with the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, 4, they were united into a community of faith. So, one of the first evidences that if, if you're, filled, you're saved and filled with the Spirit, you're going to join other believers. Okay? Right. So you're united in that community of faith. But then you've got some distinctive uh, um, um, commitments and characteristics that set you apart. And you named a couple of those. Yeah. So they were united. The believers in Christ were united in their commitment to apostolic doctrine. In other words, they observed the apostles' teaching, which was the teaching that Christ had given to them. Okay? All right. Notice that they also are committed to maintaining Christian fellowship. Right. Notice that what I just read to you. Where did they? They daily met in the temple. They daily were meeting in the homes for uh, the Lord's Supper. Okay, so they maintained uh, these uh, teaching. They maintained Christian fellowship. They observed communion, and they were constantly in prayer, as we saw in verse 42. So they're together. They shared what they had with one another. Okay, and as verse 44 and 45 says, as every man had need, they would share together. Correct. All right, so in other words, they then were faithful to assemble together uh, for corporate worship in the temple, all right, and fellowship in the temple, but they also did it in their own private homes in verse 46. So it also notes in verse 47 that they're joyous people, okay? They're joyous people. So these commitments uh, to teaching, to fellowship, to observe, observing communion and prayer, uh, in corporate worship and fellowship and in, 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 uh, in the temple and in homes. All of these commitments, all of these characteristics won them favor with all the people. These are people that live in the city that may not be believers, right. but they are being a testimony or a witness to them. Okay? And the Lord added, so because they were having favor with the people, then people were seeing their change in their life and they were being saved daily and being added to the church. Doing the things that were good, that were decent, right. that were orderly. Right. <clears throat> Lawful, even. Amen. Yeah. Right. So, like the earliest uh, Christians in Jerusalem, or the early Christians, uh, those at Ephesus, that we read that passage in Ephesians, uh, they were engaged in spiritual worship. Now, in Ephesians, it says, remember, to sing in spiritual songs and hymns and make music in your heart to the Lord. Right. So we know then that they're engaged in spiritual worship, they're motivated, and they're inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, Ephesus was a very idolatrous city. Yes. All right. Ephesus was engaged um, in worship, but they were in worship to idol gods. And many of their... Uh, uh, common practices for those that were worshiping the idol gods there in Ephesus was to drink undiluted wine so that it would induce religious ecstasy and ecstatic utterances. Okay, all right. So Paul forbids Christians to do that. He said, do not be filled with wine in excess. In other words, where you're doing, you're drunk and you're saying these ecstatic utterances. He said, don't do that. But what he did command them instead was to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice I said continually filled. Present progressive tense. Yes. It's yes. You, you're continually being be filled. Right, right, okay? right. All right. So you're being filled with the Holy Spirit, and then, then they would be spiritually enabled by the Holy Spirit to engage in very true spiritual worship that's pleasing to God and actually pleasing and edifying to the rest Amen. of God's people. Amen. You can actually look at society as they did then. You know, when you're filled with the Spirit, there is an inner joy right. that comes through expression right. of your, your bodily you know, expression. Uh, well, and and even those peace. that are not filled with the Spirit... Uh, they have a look like they've been yeah. eating lemons or whatnot. Yeah, they're sour. There's not that joy. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah right. And, and 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 what we also see then too is that they um, they don't have that inner peace. Exactly. Yeah. And right. that joy is an expression of that inner peace yes. that the Holy Spirit gives. All right, flip over to Galatians chapter five, 
And let's look at verse 22 through 25. Now, many of you know that this is a passage where he's talking about freedom in Christ, but also where we are to be bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? But the Holy Spirit, now in the verses prior to this, he talks about if you're not a believer, then you're going to produce works of the sinful, excuse me, of the sinful flesh. Right. In other words, you're going to do all those things that are sinful and ugly and nasty and uh, unpleasant to the Lord. But verse 22, but if you're living for God, right, the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Mm -hmm. Love, joy, peace, patience, sin, uh, uh, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and he says, and lastly, self-control. And then he says, there is no law against these things. Hallelujah. Not a single man-made law against those things. Amen. All right, keep reading. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. That's right. So Jesus is teaching and taught that we should uh, and can distinguish who is truly good by their character and by their deeds. In other words, by the fruit of their lives. If you really want to know who somebody is, look at the fruit they bear. Yeah. Okay. Look at the characteristics. We know this also in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 20. Now, in keeping with this teaching of Jesus, the most compelling evidence that an individual is filled with the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit in his or her life. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, fruit is produce. Right? It's, it's produce. Yep. Right? It's harvest. Okay? Uh, and so when we think about the fruit of the Spirit, the produce or the things that the people of God produce are those Christ-like virtues okay, uh, that the Holy Spirit will produce in our lives as we then submit to the Holy Spirit's holy influence. Mm -hmm. okay? So Spirit-filled living is not really difficult to discern or even to describe. It's Christ-like living, Hallelujah. and that should be our goal. In other words, you know, how, how do I live like Christ? You live like Christ lived. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to understand. Okay. Now, being filled uh, with the Holy Spirit produces a distinctive community lifestyle for the believers in Christ. Uh, the communities of faith that Christians are in will take on the same commitments, the same characteristics, that identify the early church believers as well and that they were identified as followers of Christ. So by being continually uh, daily filled with the Holy Spirit, we can live this same lifestyle. Notice I said by being continually daily filled. Okay, That's what is required. If we are not daily filled, we could end up making a mistake. Yeah. All right, uh, producing. So we need that continual filling of the Holy Spirit to maintain that Christ-like lifestyle because the Holy Spirit will produce in us all those virtues of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. So we need to aspire, we need to pray uh, to live a Spirit-filled, Christ-like life. Yes. Okay? And the benefit of doing that is, one, it glorifies God. It brings Him glory and honor. It honors Him. It pleases Him. But it's also beneficial to other people. Yes. Because we're going to not do the things in the flesh that could be harmful to people or even sin or break law. Well, the Scripture calls us, you know, the salt of the earth. Right. And being raised on the farm in the summertime, I uh, and my father taught my brother and I that you know, we need to keep the animals watered for, for their health sake, okay, livelihood. But in order for, in the summertime for, to, to uh, make the animals drink, we had to put the salt out there to make them thirsty. Right. This is what the scripture says we are. Right. We're, We're the, the salt, salt of the earth that makes the world thirst for what we have. For the Lord Jesus Christ. For the Lord Jesus yeah. Christ. Amen. Good, good illustration, Dad. 
If you have your Bibles, look at chapter 4. Now, Acts chapter 4, look at verse 31. We're going to move into the third point of the lesson, spirit-filled unity and service. Okay, This is going tying right in, that's a good segue, Dad, uh, of that illustration, to make them thirsty. Okay, yes. So how do we make them thir- thirsty? Well, we have to serve the Lord in unity. Mm-hmm. Okay, Serving the Lord by doing what he commanded us to do. Go tell. Okay, right. All right. So, now, notice that the, the church in the fourth chapter is starting to begin to experience persecution from the religious leaders and the opponents of Christ. So, facing this persecution, uh, we see that the early believers in uh, uh, the early believers in Christ in Jerusalem came together in prayer, asking God to enable them to speak His word, to share the gospel. Uh, with boldness and with authority. And so God granted their prayer. We see in the fourth chapter that Peter and John are before the uh, Sanhedrin council. Okay, And so God granted their prayer. He enabled them to remain united in speaking the word with boldness in uh, verse 31. So let's go down to uh, 431. After this prayer, asking for boldness and the ability to continue to speak, after this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Keep reading. And it says, all the believers were united in heart and mind. All right, there's the unity we're talking about. And they felt that they, what they owned was not their own, so they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give them to those in need. Okay, wow. Look at the community of faith in action here. So we see that they are being filled with the Holy Spirit and and we see that they had the spiritual power to remain united and they united in purpose, not just in fellowship, but in purpose and ministry in all kinds of circumstances. Remember, we just read where they had all favor with man and all the people. Mm -hmm. Well, now we're starting to see opposition crop up from the religious leaders. So the description here of the community of the believers in Christ at Jerusalem is kind of like that that's talked about in Acts chapter 2, verse 41. And it says that this verifies that when people are filled with the Holy Spirit, the results produced in their lives are essentially the same. So a special phrase is used to describe this. In verse 32, it says, Them that believed in Christ were of one heart and one soul. One heart and one soul. Mm -hmm. So being of one heart means that we're devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Being of one soul means that we have a shared life of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. So being... Uh, uh, one heart means we're united with the Lord. All right, being one soul means that we have a life together. You can't be a Christian independent of anybody else, Amen. Uh, other Amen. believers. You have to have a shared life. So God's judgment on the builders of the Tower of Babel was the confusion of their languages. Mm-hmm. Remember that. Right. Okay. So they could not communicate effectively. Uh, with each other, and therefore they could not be what? United in their rebellion against God. Right. See, it's not about the tower as much as their purpose for the tower. Thank you. Okay, It was to rebel against God and yes. set themselves up higher than God. Okay? This is one thing, this, this spirit-filled service for the Lord, you know, which other people hunger for, is a a thorn in the side mm-hmm. or the mm-hmm. foot rather of Satan himself, exactly. and he's going to do everything yeah. he can to try to hinder yeah. and stop that. Yeah, because he he was once the worship leader. Yes, good point. Which drew good fellowship. Point. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, um, one of the more challenging conditions uh, to create between humans is unity. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church on the day of Pentecost was spiritually God's reversal of the confusion that came from his judgment on Babel. 
Yes. Okay? So remember, we talked about God's judgment on the, at those that the people, the builders of the Tower of Babel was confusion in their language, so they couldn't understand, couldn't effectively communicate. Right. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit is God's reversal Hallelujah. of that. Okay, and we see that it's the reversal of that confusion. So, in other words, the Holy Spirit unites believers in Christ with a common language mm. of the heart Glory and of God. the soul. Mm. Okay, so in wow. the unit of uh, in the unity of the Spirit, it testifies to the world that there is one body, one Spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of us oh, all, God as we see in Ephesians chapter four. Okay. So God reverses that through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, let's look at 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3 and look at verse 5. And we're wrapping up the lesson for today. 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. If it... It, excuse me, it is not that we think we are qualified to do anything on our own. Our qualification comes from God. He has enabled us to be ministers of His new covenant. This is a covenant not written, not of written laws, but of the Spirit. The old covenant ends in death, but the new covenant, the Spirit gives life. I like that word that you used there in verse 6, enabled us. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Notice that we can serve God, but we must recognize we cannot serve God in ourselves. In what we're flesh. really saying is that we serve God by his sufficiency. In other words, I am insufficient to serve God on my own. Correct. Correct. But by the Holy Spirit, I am enabled to serve mm -hmm. God. Okay, so that's really what we're saying. So this verse of scripture says we are not sufficient of ourselves. Yes. Okay. In other words, I can't live for Christ-like life. I can't do Christ-like ministry all in my own self. Both of these are spiritual endeavors and our sufficiency for both must come from God and the agency of the Holy Spirit. So what, what I'm saying is without the enablement of the Holy Spirit, we, become, we never become sufficient. And we will, um, uh, if, and if we, well, let me rephrase that. If, if we neglect um, to depend on the Holy Spirit for our sufficiency, yes, yes. Uh, then we're not going to be sufficient. Okay, so simply having the New Testament, now don't misunderstand what I'm about to say, simply having the New Testament does not make us able ministers of the gospel. Mm -hmm. I have the New Testament. I have it in codex or book form. I have the New Testament. Just having it doesn't make me sufficient to be ministers to the, of the gospel. The Holy Spirit makes us able ministers of the new covenant of the new testament okay i have to be part of it and it has to be part of me yeah so yes we have that covenant new covenant of, of salvation by grace through faith in the lord jesus christ all right i have that all christ-like living is spiritual living yes okay yes so that means all christ-like ministry is spiritual ministry yes and that means you must do it with the spirit Hallelujah! you must have christ-like living christ-like ministry you must have its spirit-led living its spirit-led service so you must have the spirit to do it Hallelujah. to accomplishment so we are not sufficient for these uh, in ourselves we must have sincere and continuing reliance on the holy spirit to be sufficient okay so let, let me wrap it up this way. People are sometimes heard to say, and the quote, I cannot live the Christian life. It's just too hard. I cannot do it. Well, the fact is, anyone who says this is speaking the truth. They can't. We can't do it in ourselves. Right. Okay. Right. All right. But there is no excuse for not living the Christian life. You can't do it. They're speaking the truth. I can't do it in myself. Okay? Right? 
recognizing that we can't do it ourselves, should alert us to the very fact that we can live a Christ-like life only if we're sincerely committed to Christ, all right, as our Savior and Lord, and as we are committed to Him, then His Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us, and then we are enabled by God through the Holy Spirit to live for Christ and like Christ. But in fact, in, in my experience, I have found it easier to live yeah. the Christ-like life than not to live. When I look back at my past, I yeah. was a miserable right. human being. But how is it that it's easier now? Because of the Spirit. Because exactly. you have learned to follow the Spirit, to live in the Spirit. Amen. You are being continually, being. daily filled. Being. That is how you do it. Hallelujah. Okay? All right. So, when we pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we're also asking to be filled with God and with Christ. Yes. I want you to understand that. The Trinity. Okay. Right. Often when people pray to be filled with the Spirit, they don't think about it this way. Okay? When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we're submitting uh, to the sovereign, the wisdom, power, and authority of God yes. over our lives. Yes. And then we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay? All right? mm -hmm. So uh, we submit to the holy influence of the Holy Spirit over our lives. So we're living in the Spirit is really Christian discipleship. Yes. Now... There may be some of you that are listening uh, to this lesson, and maybe you are aware of fellow believers in Christ who are seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Here's my challenge to you today. Pray for them that they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. You know, we're, we can't meet right now in a classroom setting, but you're watching it. And maybe as you're watching, there is someone in your household or in your group, maybe even you're having watch parties. I don't, I don't know how you're watching. Uh, maybe there are family units together. But I would uh, uh, challenge you uh, as, as you're watching uh, to, uh, and, and desiring to be filled with the Holy Spirit, if it's appropriate in your setting, then I would say lay hands on them and pray for them to Amen. receive Amen. the gift of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Do it while you're watching. Do it while you're, while you're listening to the Word today. So we have a powerful lesson here uh, for Pentecost Sunday, May 23rd, 2021. And so we thank you, Lord, for the per uh, preserving power, yeah. Father Lord, of the Holy Spirit. I yes. praise you, Father Lord, uh, for the Holy Spirit, for the enablement of the Holy Spirit. I can't do anything without you. Uh, and when I do, it's a miserable failure. Yes. And so, yes. Lord, I thank you for that evidence that I need you, and I need to be continually being filled by you on a daily basis to, yes. to live as Christ uh, and also to minister as Christ. So empower us, Lord. Give us those gifts uh, yes. uh, in, in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Father, Lord, help us to, to follow that, but also, more importantly, enable us to be witnesses to the world around us, to be the salt and light that we yes. need to be. Lord. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Remember, we have one more lesson uh, in this quarter, and it will be on Sunday, May the 30th. Uh, and uh, that's the last lesson that will come out of Second Peter and Jude. And, uh, and then we go into a new series of lessons uh, talking about um, the uh, great prayers of the Bible. And then the second session, the second section of lessons in the summer quarter, we're going to be talking about defending the faith in a secular society. Hallelujah. So we're going to come up with some real straightforward stuff, in your face kind of things, in that second half of that lesson. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. Yes. And uh, if you need your quarterly, your new student booklet, please see me Sunday or Wednesday. Uh, and if you, you can't get to church, call me, text me, uh, email me, and uh, I'll get it to you somehow. I'll put it in the mail. Um, but we'll get you the booklet, all right? The Lord bless you. We'll see you next Sunday.